All righty, on to the next topic. Uh, here are my disclosures. So basically we talked today about the evolving landscape of IBD therapy. While we need to take a personalized approach, we need to look at IBD disease severity, their phenotype, adverse risk profile, again, how old are they, do they have diabetes, do they have lung disease, prior medication history, and I do think we do need to take into consideration the presence of extraintestinal manifestations. Some of the medications we have, as you know, corticosteroids, uh, methotrexate, uh, and thiopurines for Crohn's disease, corticosteroids or thiopurines for ulcerative colitis, the anti-TNFs basically are less selective, they have systemic uh, treatment, and therefore they can be used for patients with concomitant uh, extraintestinal manifestations. The IL-1223 JAK kinase inhibitors are also systemically available and therefore can be used in patients with extraintestinal manifestations. And we'll talk about the more selective gut agents. So IBD is not a disease just of the gut. It's a systemic disease. There are a series of extraintestinal manifestations. They occur in the eye, hepatobiliary, musculoskeletal, and dermatologic. And then we also have to consider some of the extraintestinal manifestations that are a consequence of our disease uh, or treatment. So for example, steroids leading to osteoporosis. We saw a picture early today of an anti-TNF associated rash. Patients who have previous surgery for Crohn's disease have an increased risk of developing kidney stones, obviously anemia, and we've talked about the increased risk of thromboembolic disease. So extraintestinal manifestations can either be related to the disease itself or a treatment of the disease. Now this is quite interesting when I reviewed this slide. Basically 25% of patients who have extraintestinal manifestations have the extraintestinal manifestation developed prior to the diagnosis of IBD. And in this one particular study, the average time to diagnosis was about five months. And so often you'll have an astute rheumatologist have a patient with seronegative arthritis who may have a, some diarrhea or a change in bowel habits or abdominal pain and they'll refer to you to do a colonoscopy to, and you make a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. If you look at over time in this one particular study, 50% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease will have an extraintestinal manifestation over their lifetime. So this was 50% after 30 years of diagnosis. And the risk factors for developing extraintestinal manifestations are colonic disease, perianal Crohn's disease, and smoking. Now the next thing you need to know as you decide which drug to treat a patient who has an extraintestinal manifestation is does the extraintestinal manifestation track with active IBD? So if you look at musculoskeletal complications, the axial arthropathy, the ankylosing spondylitis, does not correlate very well with disease activity. There are two different types of peripheral arthritis. One responds when the disease gets better and one which is less common does not and has its own independent course. In terms of the skin manifestations, erythema nodosum, <coughs> excuse me, uh, parallels the course of IBD, while pyoderma gangrenosum does not. Of the ocular manifestations, episcleritis and scleritis parallel the course of IBD, but uveitis, potentially a much more severe uh, sight-altering disease, uh, does not correlate well with inflammatory bowel disease activity, and we all know that PSC has no relationship to IBD activity. So let's start with the musculoskeletal extraintestinal manifestations. They are the most common. They occur in between 10 and 46 percent of patients. So arthritis in IBD patients can either be a peripheral arthritis or an axial arthritis. So peripheral is the more common, developing in 30 percent of IBD patients. It's large joints greater than small joints, so knees greater than ankles, greater than wrists. And this is, for the most part, a non-erosive uh, arthritis. You do not see changes on plain films of the hands that you do see in untreated rheumatoid arthritis. And for the most part, again, this parallels IBD, but there's a subtype of this type of arthritis that does not. Now the axial arthropathy, so things like sac sacroiliitis or ankylosing spondylitis, that's less common than the peripheral arthritis, occurs in 10% of patients. And it can be erosive, unlike the peripheral arthritis. And again, this one has an independent course. So someone who has ankylosing spondylitis and IBD do not expect their ankylosing spondylitis to get better when their IBD goes into remission. So the general treatment principles in the hands of rheumatologists working with gastroenterologists is first you evaluate, and if the IBD is active, you want to treat active IBD, and hopefully most of the joint pains will also improve. 
Now, you might be working with a rheumatologist who uses other agents, such as the DMARGE, and those would include non-steroidals. I'm going to talk about non-steroidals, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, or potentially intraarticular steroids. Now, the axial arthropathies, again, often require separate treatment of uh, if their IBD is in remission, regardless, actually. And only the DMARDs that are helpful are non-steroidals, again, methotrexate, intraarticular steroids. Um, actually, uh, non-steroidals, methotrexate, intraarticular steroids uh, are ineffective. And again, if you have a patient with an axial arthropathy like sacroiliitis or ankylosing spondylitis, the anti-TNF would be used if the patient is non-steroidal refractory. Sorry. Next slide, please. Great. So basically, this is the way rheumatologists used to classify peripheral arthritis. And you can see on the slide here, it's no longer used by rheumatologists. You either had type 1 or type 2 uh, arthritis, the, whether it involved the large joints or the small joints. The large joint disease was the one that paralleled the course of IBD, while the type 2 polyarticular small joint disease, you had to tailor IBD therapy independent of the joint disease. So how do they classify it now? Basically, you classify patients with a peripheral arthritis either have active IBD or their IBD is in remission. If they have active IBD, you're going to optimize their IBD therapy. If their IBD is in remission, you can go ahead and use non-steroidals in, in collaboration with the GI, with a PPI. We have some slides talking about non-steroidals. If the non-steroidals do not work or are not tolerated, you can add sulfasalazine or methotrexate or give steroids. And then if that doesn't work, again, their IBD is in remission, depends on what drug they're on. You could either add or switch to a different anti-TNF. And again, all these agents have been used to treat uh, ankylosing spondylitis, infliximab, adalimumab, sertilizumab, pegol, and golibumab. And if they don't work, you can then move on to a second anti-TNF. So let's talk about the axial arthropathies. Again, there's uh, ankylosing spondylitis. You're seeing fusion of the spaces here on the left, and then an MRI looking for inflammation of the SI joints. The treatment that rheumatologists will use now is uh, physical exercise, a trial of non-steroidals. And again, if they do not respond to a non-steroidal, I told you earlier that the methotrexate intraarticular steroids don't work for this entity, you move on to an anti-TNF, and then potentially a second anti-TNF. Now, if you did not have IBD, you would move on to this agent, secu how do you pronounce this one? Secu right, Co Cosentix, I think, is the trade name for it. And that's an IL-17 blocker. However, there's an issue with this, if I can go it. Um, there are some studies suggesting that this particular agent may unmask underlying IBD. So if you have a, well, if you have a patient with unmasked underlying IBD, so a person who's got IBD, in general, you may not want to use this particular agent. So again, you're working with the rheumatologist. So let's kind of talk about non-steroidals. In general, we all tell patients they should not be on non-steroidals if they have inflammatory bowel disease. There are conflicting studies about the use of NSAIDs and IBD exacerbation. Many of them are retrospective studies and have potential biases. There's this one large prospective study from the Manitoba Registry looked at, first of all, surprisingly in that registry, 49% of the patients were using non-steroidals uh, to treat their symptoms, but they did not see any risk of flares. And then there's this recent meta-analysis, I believe this is from Ashwin and his group at MGH, that looked at this and apparently came to the conclusion that there are no associations. So I do use non-steroidals with patients, certainly if they're older individuals with a PPI, with food, lowest dose necessary to control their disease, because many of these patients are miserable with joint symptoms and we have to do something. Now, several years ago, there were a number of studies that were published that looked at the selective COX-2 inhibitors. Obviously, they have less gastroduodenal toxicity. In a study looking at rheumatoid arthritis patients receiving COX-2 inhibitors compared to standard ibuprofen, there was 67% less GI ulcers and complications. Again, this is in RA and OA patients. There were two randomized controlled trials of uh, COX-2 inhibitors in arthritis, uh, for, for arthritis and IBD, and one was led by Bill Sanborn. It was a very old study from 2006. Uh, 222 patients received two weeks of salicoxib versus placebo, again, only two weeks and the relapse rates were the same. And then another study, which was much larger, or much smaller in numbers, but much longer in duration, using a drug, ETOR, 
ectoricoxib, which is not available in the United States. Anyway, but this COX-2 inhibitor for three months was not associated with an exacerbation of IBD. So I think we can take a step back with this blanket recommendation that all IBD patients need to avoid non-steroidals. I think that used sparingly and used appropriately when there are no other alternatives after failing Tylenol, and if they have an inflammatory arthritis, I think is a reasonable option. Now, what do you do with someone who has a DMARD refractory IBD-associated arthritis? Well, you can see that if they have <coughs> IBD, you can use an anti-TNF. So again, you would consider that after a three-month trial of DMARDs, assuming that they're not on an anti-TNF. Most of the data is in peripheral and axial IBD-associated arthritis. Again, you can use infliximab, adalimumab, sertilizumab, or golimumab. And then again, if insufficient control with the first anti-TNF, you can switch to a second. And again, if if um, we had uh, our colleagues here from earlier today, I think that you would hear that the rheumatologists, I don't think, are very big on therapeutic drug monitoring. They have way more drugs than we do, and so therefore they're more likely to switch, and I think this probably keeps Adam up at night. I'm surprised he hasn't found the collaborator in the rheumatology area to try to answer these questions. So the bottom line is, the, at the bottom, you can see approved FDA uh, indications for rheumatoid arthritis. You can use tofacitinib. You can use uh, anti-TNF, and so that's often a drug. Similarly, ankylosing spondylitis, you can use the anti-TNF. Psoriatic arthritis, you can use the anti-TNF. Stay away from the Cosentex, although, again, this is based on small studies. And we probably we would not be prescribing that drug. Maybe the rheumatologist would ask us, is it safe to use this agent in your patient with pre-existing IBD? What do you do for patients who have TNF-alpha refractory arthritis? Well, again, if it's rheumatoid arthritis, you can use tofacitinib, uh, the JAK kinase inhibitor, which we heard about. It's approved and effective for both peripheral arthritis in RA and psoriatic arthritis, and there are a number of ongoing studies in ankylosing spondylitis. For use, we can also use ustekinumab, IL-1223 agent. That's also approved for peripheral arthritis and uh, psoriatic arthritis with mixed results on ankylosing spondylitis. You can see that we often, when we have a patient like this, we call the rheumatologist up and try to work together depending on how the patient is doing, whether their IBD is in remission or not, and then try to choose a drug that will have an overlap. For example, if the patient has IBD and they're doing well, we probably wouldn't want the rheumatologist to choose Enbrel because there's no, no convincing data that Enbrel works in IBD. We'd have them choose a different anti-TNF. What about fetalizumab? Again, we know how it works. Small cohort studies revealed an exacerbation of arthritis in VDZ patients, even when bowel symptoms improve. But this is very interesting, large perspective, multicenter, a French study. When everyone in the country is in a database, it's easy to do large studies and follow patients. So they had 294 patients. You can see the breakdown, 173 had Crohn's, 121 had UC on vitalizumab. But at onset, 16% of these patients had inflammatory arthritis over time, and as you can see, at week 14, week 22, as many as almost 60% of patients with a peripheral, with an inflammatory arthritis got better, and that fits with, again, the inflammatory arthritis, peripheral arthritis that responds to disease activity. And so if the vitalizumab was making the disease better, you'd expect the peripheral arthritis to get better. We, again, I'm not familiar with any data in looking at ankylosing spondylitis, but as we talk about tailoring therapy, for a patient, someone with UC or Crohn's disease who had ankylosing spondylitis, vitalizumab would not be my first choice. We would use an anti-TNF or an IL-1223 inhibitor. Dermatologic manifestations, again, pyoderma and erythema nodosum. Again, erythema nodosum, as I pointed out earlier, treats IBD. You treat the IBD and it gets better. Uh, pyoderma gangrenosum, which again can be a catastrophic complication, requires input from dermatology as well as GI. Thankfully, it's seen in only less than 1% of patients with IBD, Crohn's and UC equally, and it precedes the IBD diagnosis in 22%. Everyone has seen these pictures. Peristomal pyoderma gangrenosum can be very, very difficult to treat. It has this condition of pathogy where you manipulate the area and it gets worse. And again, I think that um, we do have treatments for it, thankfully. In patients with limited disease, we can use, again, we meaning dermatologists, can use topical steroids, topical tacrolimus. You can inject. And then for patients who have more kind of debilitating, disfiguring peristomal disease that's making it difficult for the patient to wear their appliance and they're leaking and it's just a disaster, there are a number of things we can use. 
oral glucocorticosteroids, and infliximab have been studied uh, in most studies. And so this was a randomized con controlled trial of infliximab, 32 patients, small number, receiving infliximab. And you can see that 46% of patients receiving infliximab improved versus only 6% of patients with placebo. Then there was an open label, this was after a single dose, there was an open label extension where patients received doses at two and six weeks, and you can see significant improvement or remission. So again, uh, an important predictor of response was pyoderma being present for 12 weeks or less. So if the disease is misdiagnosed and it's kind of perpetuating and they finally get to a dermatologist and they've had a little lesion that got bitter, better, got worse, now is worse again, uh, if they've been on non-effective anti-TNF therapy, by waiting 14, 16, 18 weeks, the response is going to be less. Again, no reason to think that adalimumab wouldn't work as well. There are multiple case series looking at that. Oral cyclosporin can be used, again, depending on what other agents they're on. And for refractory cases, there are case reports of ustekinumab, thalidomide, IVIG is something we often go to when we're really desperate for refractory disease. And again, this is, you're working with your stoma, your wound nurse, and with dermatology. In terms of the ocular manifestations, we talked about uveitis, uh, episcleritis, and scleritis. Scleritis and episcleritis, you treat the IBD, and they tend to get better. Uveitis is the one that's more concerning, again, uh, can affect your sight. Uh, you're working with your ophthalmologist uh, to treat these patients. This is the picture of uveitis. You, know, you can get, uh, over time, cataracts, glaucoma, macular edema with central vision loss. First-line therapy, this will, again, if someone's got a red eye, I try to call the, derm uh, the ophthalmologist and get them in as an urgent visit. They will, they will treat these patients topical steroids or intraocular steroid injections. And then for refractory cases, any number of drugs. I have a series of patients who are being treated by their uh, ophthalmologists with anti-TNFs. Hepatobiliary manifestations, again, PSC has an independent course of IBD. We had really hoped that perhaps vitalizumab, because there are receptors in the biliary tree, might treat PSD, and, and unfortunately we have two recent negative studies. So we don't really, in 2019, have any treatment for PSC other than liver transplant. So basically, to summarize, uh, we've talked about how we're managing patients with IBD in 2019, looking at not everyone needs aggressive therapy. We need to stratify patients into low risk or high risk, decide what medicines they've been on, decide what their personal risk profile is in terms of what they're willing to take, uh, what their age is, their comorbidities, and then we have to look at the extraintestinal manifestations. If their extraintestinal manifestation is paralleling IBD activity, we need to just optimize the IBD activity, and those are the ones that we talked about. And if it's independent of IBD activity, that would be the axial arthritis, the pyoderma gangrenosum, or severe uveitis, and they're not on an anti-TNF, those agents can be used. Uh, let's see. And again, for patients that have failed the previous agents, then we have ustekinumab that can be used for arthritis, uh, psoriasis and pyoderma, and TOFA, which can be used for um, arthritis, uh, for extraintestinal manifestation in UC patients is only approved for UC. And then again, don't be afraid of having your patients use non-steroidals. Again, shortest period of time at the lowest doses, and many times we will use methotrexate, either oral or injectable, in patients that have ongoing uh, activity in, in their joints, and again, sulfasalazine can be used as well. Thank you very much.